Hi, this is Andrea Jones, the Access to Capital Lead on SVB's Access to Innovation team. As the financial partner of the innovation economy, SVB is proud to sponsor Startup Grind and its important work to celebrate and empower female entrepreneurs and investors. At SVB, our mission is to increase our clients' probability of success. For nearly 40 years, we have provided innovators, enterprises, and investors the services they need to succeed, giving us unrivaled experience with startups, fast-growing tech, life science, and healthcare companies, and their investors. Our clients are the most innovative companies around the world, and they are tackling some of the world's biggest issues. SVB aims to be a catalyst for good in our sector by offering access to the innovation economy for all. We are proud to support organizations that are committed to accelerating diversity like Startup Grind, The Board List, Valence, and many, many others. Through SVB's Access to Innovation team, we are working to advance women, Black, and Latinx individuals to positions of influence within the innovation economy. The team works to, one, increase the pipeline of diverse talent for our clients with powerful partnerships, two, connect diverse groups to SVB's vast network within the innovation economy, and three, unlock greater access to capital, professional relationships, and career opportunities. We know that diverse perspectives and inclusive environments ignite new ideas and power innovation. SVB is intentionally and strategically investing for a world where everyone can bring their bold ideas to life. We invite you to learn more about SVB and the Access to Innovation team at svb.com. A massive thank you to Alana and Hunter for their fantastic insights on the art of negotiating. And now that you're all equipped with negotiating prowess, it's time to utilize those skills. And what better way to do it than when it comes to fundraising? And more importantly, fundraising in an economic downturn. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome our distinguished VC panelists who will be sharing their top tips on what founders should be doing to raise in market conditions like these. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Gary Stewart, Managing Director at Techstars NYC, Charmaine Hayden, Founding Partner at Good Soil VC, Falake Shasana, Head of New Strategic Channels at Silicon Valley Bank, and Marie Rocha, Founder and General Partner at Realist Ventures, who will be moderating the session. I hope you have your pens and notepads ready because they are going to be a lot of takeaways from the session. Over to you, our panelists. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be on this panel with you all today. Um, obviously, we're here today to talk a little bit about DEI and fundraising and a down market. Um, DEI continues to be a concern in the community, obviously, because um, as you, most of you know, overlooked, underrepresented, under network, minoritized, whichever term you use, um, those founders continue to um, seek funding and lack funding. Those The number of founders who were received capital from venture, um, I think, decreased last year. And, and, and so at the very least, these panels serve as um, or are necessary for the information transfer. So I'm super excited to hear your thoughts on the um, opportunities. I myself hadn't considered venture uh, as a career path. Um, I never raised venture for my previous companies because I just didn't even think it was a possibility, especially as a black woman. I uh, got into venture because of curiosity. Um, I was mostly doing some due diligence for high net worth individuals who wanted to get into this space and my backgrounds in software engineering. So it sort of lent me um, the opportunities to do that. And the more deals I saw, none of them looked like women or, or were women or looked like me or sort of represented the demographics that um, I was more familiar with. So I'm really excited to hear how you all got into your career path to um, not only 
help um, founders, but be capital allocators. And so um, I'm excited to hear your journey. My journey has not been easy. We don't have enough time to go through that today, but um, I'm sure neither do you, all of you, but we certainly hope to kind of sort of tap into uh, what we've experienced and kind of help um, the next founders um, or founders as they raise capital. So I'll stop. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, I thought I heard someone unmute. So I'm interested to generally um, yeah. know a little bit about your experiences as um, venture partners, founders, and um, stakeholders working in this space. Um, what do you think is the highest challenge for um, diverse entrepreneurs? And I guess I'll start with Charmaine. Okay, hello. So lovely to be on a panel with such esteemed individuals. Um, great to see some familiar faces. Um, I guess for me, um, similar to yourself, um, in founding my own company 22 years ago, I didn't know, I didn't even actually know that venture was a thing. I didn't know anything about the asset class at all. Um, so it was a real learning journey for me getting on the, on the wagon. Um, and I started with making angel investments and then getting really curious about the space and wanting to, to find out a bit more um, about how we can, we can actually invest more because I was only being able to invest like 20, 20 K checks, which as I, I know now was not significant enough. Obviously it was, it was important to be able to give founders um, the, a, a bit of money to play around and to fail with um, and, and or not, um, but also kind of just give them something. It was definitely a tuition fee to the game for myself and my team, um, but it, it gave us a thirst for more and wanting to be able to, to build more and to be able to invest more capital specifically within the diaspora. I guess in terms of hurdles with raising specifically now, because I did pivot away from, I was initially um, looking at underrepresented founders in the UK, but for, pivoted to Africa. Um, so I invest in pre-seed and seed stage um, startups that are looking at um, impactful projects, um, both tech and tech enabled um, on the continent. But in terms of the, the hurdles that these founders are facing is for mine specifically here is number one already just like a massive bias towards the continent as a whole. Um, and the and not just because of the, the risks that are associated with the continent, but also with the abilities of these founders and which we see across the board in terms of the diaspora. And I think that can work in two ways. It can actually work really well because it can be really shocking for um, a, a fund manager or an investment um, team member who actually do finally stumble across one of these diaspora and actually like, oh, you smart. Like you can actually perform. Oh, we're really shocked about this. However, getting those said founders in the door in the first place to have that conversation, to demonstrate their key in intellect, their ability to scale and build um, is a different conversation. Uh, we all know that there's been a lot of lip service around black founders and their ability to, to, to fundraise. We all spout the numbers ourselves. We all know them off by heart, so I won't reel them off. Um, I'm sure someone else will, just for the sake of anyone who's listening who may be interested, but they're very readily available online. Um, I think the main thing is, like, how do we get past um, this lip service as opposed to what are the hurdles and how do we celebrate the wins of the the the, the black founders that are in existence. I say black founders because we do actually express a lot more interest in the rest of the DNI um, when we're looking at um, subsections of society. So I'm 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 very bold in just kind of really highlighting that backgrounds also. So yeah, those are the, those are, I guess the main hurdles for me. Um, I'll pass over to someone else. I want to just say that um, as a small check writer, take pride in that because um, it's just a, a nice way to sort of ride the journey with the founder that you believe in. And so um, if anyone's listening, like hang on to your small checks because uh, I think they're also equally valuable sometimes. So I wanted to just champion you and your journey of writing small checks because um, I certainly think I got here because of that and want to celebrate that a little bit. Um, Gary, I don't know if you wanted to add to some of this. I would love to hear about your own journey um, getting here as an allocator. Yeah, well, thanks for having me and for the invitations. I mean, I guess my journey has been a bit circuitous. So, you know, I went to Yale College and Yale Law School, had no idea as a good immigrant immigrant kid from Jamaica who grew up in the Bronx about anything related to entrepreneurship, really. I just thought you had to be like a lawyer or a doctor. And I knew I didn't like blood that much. So law became like kind of really exciting um, until I actually started doing it. Then I realized it wasn't that exciting. 
Um, and so I did that for about five years, corporate law in uh, New York and then in London. And then eventually I made my way to Spain. And then um, I realized I need to find a way to actually make a life for myself in Spain because um, being a lawyer there, you know, I could do it as an expat, but they didn't want me to stay there indefinitely and still get the American salary. Um, and so that's how I created my first company, which was a venture bat startup, a property tech company. Um, we raised a few million dollars for it, eventually sold it. Um, and then from there, I went to teaching about entrepreneurship and then uh, a, a large corporate. This is soon after kind of the, you know, uh, tech stars and Y Combinator kind of started with accelerators. A company called Telefonica said that they wanted to set up a whole kind of tech ecosystem all the way from kind of pre-seed to IPO. And they wanted me to help with the kind of early stage stuff to launch it, which I did in Spain. And then it was in 13 countries. And by the time I left that, the portfolio was worth about $1.6 billion just in the UK, which I moved over to in 2014 until 2019. Um, I did a startup after that, which is venture backed. Um, but then I kind of realized that like in the environment that we're in right now, I didn't really think like anytime the, 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 the water gets a little too hot, I'm always like, I need to have a plan B. I'm kind of, I always like to have a plan B. And luckily this is around the same time that tech stars came about and said they were looking for a director to uh, run their JP Morgan program in New York City. Um, and that's what I'm doing now. And it's not really my plan B in case anyone from Techstars is listening, it's really now the plan A. Because at the end of the day, um, it really is the same mission, which is helping underrepresented founders get access to capital. And things really do look a lot differently when you have capital, um, both in terms of the founders and in terms of uh, the partners that are willing to work with you. When you actually just advocate for it, people are kind of nice to you. Um, they see you as a little bit annoying, but when you actually have money, it's like all of a sudden everyone wants to be your friend. And so that's been kind of a really interesting shift in terms of like what I see as the biggest hurdles. Cause I still think of myself in a lot of ways, myself in a lot of ways as a founder, I think it's a lack of credibility. I mean, as someone who had this portfolio worth $1.6 billion, two Yale degrees, I sometimes teach at Yale law school as a visiting professor. I still felt like when I went into the room, people didn't always take me seriously. You know, um, I was talking about this last week with Song Laurent who is the CEO and co-founder of Squire. They raised 160 million now. Um, and valuation last time I think was 750 million. And it's just that, you know, if you're a black guy going into a room, they automatically want to start saying that it's a niche product. It doesn't make a difference what you're doing. Um, if it has anything whatsoever to do with um, women or minorities, it's niche, even though women and minorities are 70% of the US population. Um, and I think that there's this kind of fundamental lack of credibility. Like, can you actually really do this? And it's funny because I sit on some investment committees and I'll see people get super excited about like, you know, this young white lady or young white guy. And it's like, why are you so excited? Oh, they worked at McKinsey or they work at Goldman. I'm like, so did a lot of black people, but you're not giving them any money, you know? So it's kind of like why it, you see the kind of the way that people regard people differently and, and, and the kind of extra hoops that we have to jump through. And that usually we can never really kind of successfully make it through anyway. Um, so I think this kind of leads me to my conclusion, which is, again, why I kind of uh, bowed out a little bit of the venture game, which is really focus on your business fundamentals. Uh, see if there's a way to bootstrap your own business. I did this conference at Howard University and there was an Asian woman and she was speaking and I kind of listened to her like she was the oracle. Um, and she said, you know what, if you're an underrepresented person, Think about like how you can kind of generate some uh, secure income streams, um, you know, like property. See if there's someone that's willing to pay you to do what you really want to do anyway, while you can then kind of focus on your startup at your own pace and funding it yourself. And I actually thought that was like some of the best advice. And that's kind of the advice that I'm following right now, which is the venture game is fun, but like you kind of sometimes get run around in circles and it's really tiring and demeaning and demoralizing. Um, and so sometimes it's just great to just pull back and be like, I don't really need you and I don't really want you. Um, and, and that's the way I think of it. Last thing I'll say that I think was really interesting that Song called out at the session um, was sometimes the people who are the hardest on Black folks are other Black folks. Um, you know, as he pointed out, even though now Squire has raised money from SoftBank and they've also raised money from Tiger, two of the biggest venture capital funds in the world, um, or at least early stage investors in the world, depending, if you don't want to call them venture capital funds, um, you know, he said that it was really difficult at the beginning to convince Black fund managers to take a risk on him because maybe they also thought, like, why would we take a risk on this kind of project that that seems to be two Black men doing something that might stereotypically look to be a minority-focused business? So I think that's also something that's important to kind of call out because when I was a founder, some of the people who gave me the worst feedback, the harshest feedback, were Black people with no money. 
And I really hated that. And it kind of made me just like very, very bitter. Um, so I would also say that part of what we need to do is to kind of make sure that we treat each other nicely. And if you don't have the capital, it's fine. Just say it. But don't run me around in circles just because you don't have the capital and you, you, you're proud. Uh, so that would be the last bit of advice that I would just put out there. Wow. You said so many things that need a follow-up panel. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> there are just so many things. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, I can totally relate to so many of that, which is why I often love these conversations where we can openly um, and have the autonomy to be ourselves and kind of commiserate together in some ways. Um, and um, Folake, I really, sorry if I butchered that. I, I really was trying, but I think it's Folake. Yeah, you're doing well. <laughs> Thank you. I will say like my name today. without doing the sorry I butchered it thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean my name is Marie, and I get Maria, Marianne, and all sorts of other mispronunciations. So I do try my best to yeah, do um, okay at this. But um, really wanted good. to also get your thoughts on this, your journey, as well as the approach um, to some of the challenges um, diverse entrepreneurs face. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm loving the conversation already. Clearly, Charmaine and Gary did like you know, came to do like full transparency, open kimono, we're like pulling no punches here with our uh, with our challenges. Um, so yeah, in terms of my journey, I guess I come from, you know, the, the corporate uh, side of the hat. So some similar, so a lot of uh, what Guy just said resonated in the sense that, again, you know, African descent, but, you know, grew up in the UK and, you know, ex like excelling was the only option, right? So like, you know, you ace everything in school, you get the best possible grades, top of your class and everything. But you're actually kind of clueless about how the world works, right? Because you're sort of just primed to go and be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, and everything else is kind of a waste of time in your parents' eyes. So anyway, for my sins, I've kind of ended up as a computer engineer. Um, I actually started up in a in a tech startup very, very long time ago. I say tech 1.0 and I found it incredibly boring. I was like, I don't want to sit in front of a screen coding for the rest of my life. Like, what is this? But what I did, <laughs> what I did find interesting is that like, because it was such a small company, you know, I was sat next to the CEO and I could see them having all these discussions about fundraising and this and that and more of like the business chat, if you will. So I ended up doing a second degree in financial mathematics and that pivoted me into banking and finance. So I joined an investment bank, um, did kind of investment banking stuff, if you want to call it that, for about 15 years. And part of the reason I left that and then joined Silicon Valley Bank was some of the stuff that's been spoken about already, which is that you know, I find myself moving up in this, you know, incredibly aggressive, fast paced, you know, like career. And I sort of got to the point where I turned around and I realized that actually I spent 15 years helping the same demographic of, dem demographic of people get richer. In other words, I'm helping rich white men get richer. And there was no colleagues who looked like me, whether women or black, and no clients who looked like me. Right. And so I started to realize that, okay, this is interesting. And what seemed like prestige at the time, oh, I got into this top investment bank or whatever, now started to feel like, actually, why am I like the solo person in this mountain? You know, where are the people who are supposed to be coming along with us? Like, why aren't there, you know, Black businesses or, you know, women CEOs around the table? What's going on? And then I would also notice that if I'm having conversations with my friends outside of my corporate life, then I have tons of friends who are trying to start businesses. But guess what? They were all bootstrapping. They were all playing through their credit cards. They were all begging friends and family for money. And to the point we just said earlier, the minds were our worst critic, right? Because everybody on this call knows somebody who's asking for money and you go running for the hills. You're like, oh, no, listen, I'm not trying to get involved because you lend your friend money. What usually happens is the friendship breaks down and you don't get the money back, right? Fail and fail. Um, so it started to get me thinking like, okay, what is this? How come I know about this banking world where I've been working in debt capital markets where literally... I pitch to lend people money for a living, right? Literally, I'm fighting with the other investment banks to give you money, <laughs> right? And then outside of that life, you know, I have friends who are like, uh, you know, they can't raise a dime or they don't even understand how it works, which I think was the other thing. And so I started, it's sort of the pieces started to come together and I realized, hang on, you know, what? maybe you get older and you start thinking about like the value add that you're giving into the world and you start to have a little bit more of like an existential life crisis things. I don't know, for whatever reason, anyway, I got to the point where I realized that, look, I needed to bring these two worlds together. I needed to understand, okay, this is how the investment banking world works. This is how leverage works. This is how private equity works. And then this is what's on the other side of it. Lots of innovation, lots of amazing people across the diaspora, whether in America, whether in the UK, whether across all the nations in Africa, have great ideas. But how come none of them seem to be close to any pockets of capital to help these ideas come to life. And couple that in a world where everything is now tech, right? Absolutely everything we do 
is now tech. So not only are these people not getting, you know, hands on anything, but everything we're doing is now consumed in tech. And if tech is powered by VCs and VCs are powering, as we know, these, you know, ridiculous stats where negligible, you know, basis points go to black founders or female founders, then how come we're all part of this world where we're watching this, this bifurcation happen with nothing, you know, to be able to do about it? So in any case, I started um, a little sort of investment club with a friend of mine uh, and eight other women in Africa to try to start saying, okay, how do we actually get women at least a bit more knowledgeable about the markets and to start to deploy? And I found some really interesting things out of it, which is that people are very risk of us. Everyone was like, I don't want to lose money. So nobody actually really wanted to deploy into anything. And they would just, you know, every month we would kind of vote on stuff to do. And they would just deploy into like fixed income securities. Like, I don't want to lose any money. I don't want my capital to risk. You know, they would barely get involved into anything. So I also found that really interesting. And it got me thinking about the fact that, okay, there's a lack of access, right? There's a lack of knowledge or like risk appetite. And there's definitely a lack of capital. Um, anyway, fast track 2019, I joined Silicon Valley Bank. I actually initially came to set up warehouse lending, which again was bringing some of my knowledge I had in debt capital markets, but to the tech space. And, you know, 2020 happened. We all know a lot of us kind of had a, you know, call to action moment to try to do something a bit more. Um, and I felt like a real calling to pivot from just, you know, sort of fintech lending into actually challenging ourselves and the bank to say, look, what happens when you actually put a team together that solely puts Black and women at the forefront of your client coverage? You know, so some other points you mentioned about Sanj, it's like, end of the day, they're great people. But if they're not seen as great people because you don't have people looking at them that way or bringing them into the rooms, then they just don't get access to the capital. But if I cover you in the same way a French person and an investment bank covers a French client, then suddenly you're actually having these rooms, you know, get opened up. And so we get to see more people come in and, uh, you know, give them more exposure, hopefully reduce that knowledge gap, and then eventually as well, make sure that we're deploying capital. So that's how I found myself here. Wow, you all have such interesting journeys. I, I love to see that because um my path was also like engineering to VC. So it's always like great to meet people who sort of didn't do like the banking and sort of, you know, follow that path. Um, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about just because you all each point out the investment um piece. Um, what should founders think about in preparation for seeking funding, especially the pitch decks and or the pitch presentation itself? Uh, what roles do you think boards should play in the fundraising process and how soon should they get involved? I know that sometimes, um, you know, founders can be very intimidated by their boards, right? Because that's there's this, this like weird dogma about boards. But um, I'd like to get your taking based on your experience. And Charmaine, I would love to start with you. Okay, um, so first and foremost, I think that that's a very subjective question. Um, it depends who you're pitching to. Um, myself, I actually don't give a crap about what people's pitch decks look like, as long as the numbers make sense and the founder has a, a, a market share that is big enough, that is driving for a market share that's big enough of a big enough market. Um, and I believe that that founder can capitalize on that market. Everything else is just a doorknob in the sands. Yeah, it actually means pretty little to nothing but again um there are some people who are very presentation heavy i would say definitely for someone who has an attention span like me um to keep it as as, as slight as possible for your intro um deck do a one pager talk something small through um and then get an intro call out where we just have a general conversation um i think that there's also there's uh, a big assumption that your first call is is the pitch um, and the investor like hey whoa 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 I, I wasn't ready for this I just wanted to to have a conversation get a bit of a, a, a vibe with you um, because we do um, it is really based on on conversations and how we build rapport with people um, and also to ask really direct questions um, and I I mean look at your your investor as a fellow startup because we're startups we're always raising, we're always raising more than founders. Our raising journey is never ever gonna stop, right? So we should have some empathy um, and we should be treated accordingly. And we're also pitching for the deal right back if it's the right deal. So when I go to conferences or when I'm speaking to LPs, I'm really direct, I'm like, do you have capital to deploy? How much do you have to deploy? When are you deploying? Are you closed for this year? When, it, when are you reopening? Do you have an appetite for Africa? What are your thoughts on deploying into black and female founders? This is what we're investing in. And then 
if those answers are answered correctly, that I know that I'm not wasting my time because I don't want my founders wasting time. They're coming to me and they're having conversations when they could be building, which is what they really want to do. They're only raising capital so that they can build, not so that they can have a fake conversation with me because they don't care about me. And unless we get the deal done, I don't really care about them. Uh, it's the reality. I just want to get a good deal done. I want to be able to make in a good way. So how do we minimize that process and how do we make sure those founders do? Having those clear cut conversations. And I think for investors, it's like just giving clear answers. Are you interested or not? Yes, no, maybe so. If it's a maybe so, what are the what are the, the key components that will help us to get to a decision quicker? And I think that those things are really, really important. Obviously, for founders in a market like this, be scrappy, understand that the chances of success are really low unless you're a phenomenal founder. What makes you the phenomenal founder that's going to be able to overcome the, 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 the current economic crisis? And if you are built for this, then you're going to you're going to succeed. I wouldn't pay too much mind to a lot of the naysaying. And there's a lot of dampening of spirits. At the moment, I understand that it's a hard time, but if you're building now, especially if you're a founder that has never really had anything to build with, you don't know any different. You don't really understand that part of the journey. Just build, grow, get your initial customers in and make sure this product market fit. And then that's the best way to stand out. I think trying to raise and trying to compete with other startups and focusing on the rest of the world of startups is similar to a bunch of VCs all just following each other in a herd-like fashion around a one person points, oh, we're gonna do, we're gonna do fintech now so everybody runs over there and it's just like yeah it doesn't really work like that it do you have a viable product and this is why we're in the current state that we are because a lot of people follow in the FOMO style deals um, and they weren't paying attention and I think that everybody should look at that including LPs um, VCs um, to make sure that we're all taking the right steps to make sure that our fiduciary responsibilities are being adhered to so I hope that answers your question okay no, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to unpack the uh, how your deck look thing, but again, another panel because um, I often like hear people paying like thousands of dollars for deck design. And I'm just like, at the end of the day, I'd like for you to, you know, I'd much prefer founders were using that app funding for marketing and growth and not um, deck design, but it is what it is. Um, Gary, I wanted to also um, add, like, as you you know, obviously, I think Charmaine covered a lot of this, but I wanted to ask a little bit of it's as an entrepreneur, um, how should founders go about finding investors and what type of people should they be um, looking for resources and um, ways to focus on in terms of their um, fundraising process? If you wanted to, like, um, share your own journey, that would be great as well, because I'm sure it's colorful. Yeah, no. So, I mean, I think I wanted to answer your second question first, and I'll get back to that one, which is that I think, you know, and this is a mistake I made um, both times in my companies, like you don't really need a board at the very earliest stages of your company, right? I think like after someone has put in substantial money into your business um, for different institutional reasons, they may need to have a board role for kind of governance purposes, but I'm not really sure the value that a board plays in a company at the very earliest stages, right? And it could be a bit of a distraction. So that would be kind of like one bit I would just throw out there. Um, and, and if you are gonna do a board, just make sure it's a board of people who are really adding value and not a board of people who are just trying to kind of look like board members, right? Meaning like, oh, well, we are investors. That means that we need to have monthly board meetings. Well, if you're gonna open doors for me and do re some real stuff for me, yeah, otherwise this is a waste of my time. Um, I think that goes into a little bit about like, um, how you should kind of look for your investors. I think that the best advice for looking for investors is, um, you know, right now it's kind of like dating, right? Like people don't, people could be gay, straight, trans, whatever, and they're all in the same mix. And you're just asking people like randomly, hey, are you interested in me? I think like the much more intelligent approach is like, go after your segment, right? And I think especially if you're an underrepresented founder, I, I'm, I'm saying to my startups, go after people who are looking for black founders, go after people who are looking for female founders, Go after people that have a track record of investing in people like you, because the likelihood that you're going to convince somebody who's never invested in a person like you that you should be the first is a lot more distant than if someone has a stated aim of looking for your type of demographic. Similarly, uh, go after people who invest in your vertical. So if you're a healthcare startup, go after people who invest in healthcare. Like, don't just do these random searches going around asking everyone, hey, 
do you have some money for me? Like that's just not likely to be a very effective strategy, just like it's not effective in terms of searching for an apartment or searching for a mate. Like you generally have to tailor a search to kind of a, a number of different criteria um, and, and kind of make sure that you know what those are. Another mistake I see founders making is that they all think that they need to go after venture capital lists at the very, very beginning. So it's like, I see founders, I'm like, do you have your MVP yet? No, but I'm raising $2 million and I'm talking to the Sequoia. Really, that's not going to happen unless you're like Adam Newman, right? Um, so the other thing is understand how the game is played. These are institutional investors who do not invest in kind of pre-seed rounds for the most part, unless you're some sort of extraordinary entrepreneur, which means someone that's really well regarded within their circles. So that means that you should be looking at the sort of uh, investor that is relevant to your particular phase. So you can see what I'm doing. I'm like, go after people who focus on your demographic, your gender, your vertical, your stage. Um, and then the list that before seemed kind of very unwieldy will start to kind of come down to a much smaller number of people that you have a realistic shot of converting. And then I think in terms of, you know, the mistakes, other mistakes I think founders make or that the advice I would think that like you'd want to have as a founder. And I had to learn this myself is that it doesn't make a difference how wonderful your pitch is. Uh, investors like to think of themselves as alphas. Most of them are betas. Right. Which means that they follow the herd. Like I talked to one investor in New York, the entire thesis is I only invest based on who the co-investor is, by, based on who the lead investor is. You'd be surprised I was talking to a lot of really prominent funds. And the first question you would ask is, well, who's your lead investor, right? Because essentially they want to follow, they don't want to lead. So I think that's uh, one big thing. And the second thing is a lot of them will be limited by the vertical. So in the same way that they don't want to be the first one to express interest in you, they're like, I love what you're doing. You're the best founder I've ever seen. But can you find someone else to validate that? Like the same way, I think like they like to follow the patterns as well and saying like, what industry are you in? So when I was talking to Sung last week for the Fireside Chat, I was like, how did you get a whole bunch of big VCs to invest in like a barbershop management platform? He's like, oh, well, because they didn't see this barbershop management. They saw it as B2B SaaS. And they could see kind of other companies that were doing a lot, making a lot of money in that particular space. And they just then applied that to the barbershop space. But it was like the B2B SaaS thing. And I think like when I was reading, when I went back to teach, I didn't, I guess I'd under, underestimate as a founder how important the industry that you are trying to disrupt is in term, and the thesis of disruption in terms of then why the investor may or may not be interested in you. So they are following basically certain trends, which are related to certain hypotheses about which industries are most likely to be disrupted and why. And I think like having a narrative that kind of falls into that will increase the likelihood that you get funded. And lastly, because I see that we have the 10 minute warning, um, what I would say is that I underestimated how important the deck is and the narrative is. So it is really, really important because I think you have to understand the dynamics of the game, which is that each investor might be listening to like 3000 pitches. Uh, what they're trying to figure out really, really quickly is whether or not your trailer is interesting enough to want to see a little bit more of the movie. So make sure you have a really good trailer because no one's interested in watching your movie without a trailer. Gary, we're going to have a blast when we hang out in the city. I'm in Connecticut, so okay. um, <laughs> and I, of course, I'd love to hang out with all of you, but you're a little bit further. But um, there's just so much there to um, unpack. So we have a 10 minute warning. So what I wanted to do is to kind of just do a quick like get your thoughts, maybe keep it down to about a minute and a half each. Um, just really um, wanting to wrap it up and kind of give founders some really Hope, hopefully some hope um, going forward, considering the market. And um, so, Falake, I wanted to start with you. Uh, where do you think uh, their biggest gaps are in the in your field? Um, obviously, at, at Silicon Valley Bank. And how do you think we can change that? And how can we support you as well onward? Where the gaps are? Okay, that's like a broad question. I think, you know, just thinking about it in the context of the founder, um, really what we're trying to do is, is bridge that um, that access gap, right? So, so for us, we're looking at access to capital, access to knowledge, access to networks. So everything that, you know, um, you know Gary and Shemaine just mentioned, which is the like, end of the day, everyone has a finite amount of time. People sort of feel like they look at thousands of pitches all day long. They, everybody has, you know, the next genius idea and nobody really believes your idea is better than the others. So how do we sort of cut through all of that noise to give you, you know, the best chance, which I think sometimes I look at this in two ways. One is um, ultimately how, how should founders be positioning themselves? I say, don't go really to like the investor that you want right off the back when you're less experienced. I would say go to those founder, uh, investors 
just to build a, a conversation, just to build a, a relationship. Don't go for any ask. Maybe if you're at Series A, go for somebody who's much later on so that you're kind of asking them, you know, what are their thoughts? How, how do they see their market versus the early stage market? Just so you get a little bit more sort of broader market knowledge and you get a feel for that person. And then what, I'll, what I tend to find is indirectly, then that person says, oh, okay, what you're doing is really interesting. I should put you in touch with blah, right? I think sometimes when you go for this direct, hey, I'm looking to fundraise and, uh, you know, I'm going to disrupt the next whatever it is. Then it's like, unless you're really coming with something truly differentiated, it can feel a bit like, okay, been there, done that. And sometimes that's really disheartening for the founder when you just get sort of like, you know, shut down right off the bat. So I think sometimes I would say just to kind of get yourself a little bit uh, more warmed up, you know, like maybe go build up those those relationships and those conversations where it's not with the person you're directly looking to seek investment from, um, is what I would say. Um, and then I would say to, you know, to the investors, what again, we're trying to bridge for them is like having them be aware of their blind spots. You know, I think it's really easy for investors to feel like they're the ones with, with with the magic ball, like they the ones that can see the future. And the reality is we're all just people. Everyone's just taking a bet on an opportunity and a bet on someone's ability to execute and someone's ability to build a good team, on on the market being there, on you know, consumers having finances to 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 purchase that product or the B2B companies deciding that your SaaS product is better than the next, whatever it is, right? You we're not really any better than 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 the next person. But I think sometimes in the space, there's a little bit of an air of elitism that makes people feel a little bit like they they know more than they do. So I think my challenge, I think what we also try to do with the space is actually gather the investors who who don't necessarily see themselves as you know, uh, as, as knowing all things, because that's when you then actually get to unlock some really good alpha. You then get to actually meet some interesting founders that you don't normally get to be in a room with um, ordinarily, right? So um, I think that's kind of the space that we're trying to play at SVB is like, given that we sit like at the heart of both sides of the table, how do we bring these right people together in a meaningful way? And you know what? Not everyone's going to care about this, right? So fundamentally, let's just all remember that this is a game for capitalism. People want to make money. So no one's going to necessarily care about you or your business until they think they're going to make money from it. So maybe the initial play is, you know, as you say, find people who have an, who have a personal ax to say, actually, I want to deploy into a female founder. I want to deploy into a black person. I have an interest in this segment and what have you. And then when you demonstrate and you execute in that, everybody else comes piling in. I think that's the point we said about the herd mentality, you know, um, earlier on. It is literally a, a game. Um, and so part of what we want to do is, is sort of, I guess, help help black founders you know, navigate that game while still feeling uplifted because the market's hard but guess what we're already knowing how to make you know lemonades from from lemons so we can do it okay we're down to five minutes oh my gosh we have like at least a gazillion questions to <laughs> to get through but um we have some questions from the audience i wanted to address um really quickly um i'll let you each go maybe a minute each just trying to cut down so i can get all of your thoughts um what three startups or maybe industries that you're really excited about about right now uh, i'll start with uh, charmaine I can't believe I'm wasting time like that getting the mic off um knowing that we are yeah um so it, for me um uh it's sustainable tech as a whole um I do have a sweet spot at the moment um for fintech and agrotech um and then anything to do with green or clean energy or energy access um one of my I guess two two I don't know I'll do three um so the, the my portfolio companies I'm really excited about. I'm really immersed into the startups that I work with. Um, Zpay being one of our biggest, um, it's a remittance company um, and it's growing and scaling really fast. And I'm so excited that we got in on that one um, and we've gone on to reinvest in them. Um, and then one of our most recent deals um, that we've done, which is called the Green Exchange, um, which um, is a green bond platform Um for the continent um i will and, and then another one which is zuberi which is doing payment streaming um so yeah I'll, I'll leave it at that i'm really really excited and someone else asked me a question about where i invest specifically so sub-saharan africa as a whole um we have boots on the ground in six countries um but most of our investments at the moment have been in ghana thank you um gary can you share some like just three startups or industries that you're interested in right now yeah, so uh, for Techstars New York, you know, we're focusing on 
fintech with a big focus on financial inclusion, health tech, and ed tech. And basically, I just focused on the areas where there were already a lot of people of color working, um, and they're strategically relevant to New York City. And I would say my advice for any founder is just focus on a big problem and try to solve it, and then generate traction and the rest will take care of itself. That's really great advice. Um, for Lake? I mean, I'd say we're industry agnostic, right, as a bank. So obviously, we we providing venture debt um, and supporting all kinds of founders. I particularly very interested in looking at health tech and femtech um, in particular, um, especially as it relates to um, Black uh, illnesses and looking at how healthcare is a little bit, you know, bifurcated in terms of where uh, capital is deployed. But again, ultimately, we look at we look we look across the please. Great. Um, there's another question, and it looks like we've gotten ourselves a little bit more time. Um, for seed investments, how do you define the amount to raise? Is there a formula? Um, it's always hard to be a panelist or the the moderator on these panels because I also have thoughts, but I won't share. But is there a formula that you would advise for founders for their initial seed um, round? I mean, I think in general, like the way you should be thinking about it is that um, there's a relationship between kind of risk and how much traction you've generated, right? Um, and so the more traction you have, then the more money you can ask for um, and the money should really be uh, to help you kind of get to the next, get through the next um, 12 to 18 months to hit the next milestone. So uh, rather than thinking about specific amounts, I think the question you should really be trying to answer is how much money do I need to get from where I am now to the next major milestone that will then classify me as if I'm pre-seed seed, if I'm seed series A, if I'm series A, series B. The idea is that it's kind of like a bunch of different layers in a game. And you have to get to the end of each game, you need a certain amount of money or capital. And your job is to tell the investor, depending on the industry that you're in and kind of benchmarks, how much money are you going to need to get to the next phase? So there's no kind of universal answer. It's really going to be tied to your specific industry. But you as a business person, and this is what we have to focus on, you know, I think a lot of times, like a lot of founders don't think about the money and the business. The, the goal is for you as a business person to be able to communicate to an investor how much money you're going to need. And then what are they going, what, how is that going to affect the valuation? So if you give me 18, if you give me a million dollars, that means I'm going to be able to hit X objective, which means a company is going to be worth three or four times what it's worth now. If you can help them to understand that, then I think you can um, raise more or less money depending on the story that you're telling. Great. And then um, I wanted to just I think we have some time for all three of you to chime in on this one question. Um, what is your advice for getting the initial funding discussion started with, with um, investors? Um, Falake, if you don't mind sharing first, and then we can go to Charmaine and Gary wrap up. Yeah, I just wanted to just maybe do a follow-up then to that to that last question, because um, particularly in this environment, right, the market's a top year and it's probably going to take longer for anybody to fundraise. So I think it's actually really important to um, make sure that you're asking for enough money, if that makes sense, and make sure that you're doing that with enough um, time, let's say, for your business to then operate. Because one thing I've seen recently that I think is incredibly scary, um, and sort of the advice I want to impart with people is that, you know, I've heard a situation where a founder was, was fundraising, and they had maybe less than six months left. And so this particular investor um, was saying that they were doing due diligence and they wanted exclusivity and all this stuff. And so by the time, you know, that was underway, the investor took up maybe three months of the person's time and then somehow pulled out or changed their mind. I don't know. So at seed stage, what on earth are you spending three months due diligence thing? Like the, the company is, you know, are very much at a nascent stage, but they've kind of let the company almost run down to the ground with only three months left. So I think, you know, it's really, really critical that you do know how to size for what it is you're trying to build. Um, as you begin those conversations and then in, in those conversations with investors, make sure you're giving yourself that sufficient time. Um, you know, don't it, it's going to take longer than you expect to fundraise. So don't do it uh, and put yourself in a really, really precarious position where you're going to be out of money. Yep. Charmaine. I forgot what the question was. I've got so into Flake's answer that I've <laughs> That's okay. Um, what is your advice for getting the initial conversation started with a, a founder, with a uh, an investor? 
Um, so similar to what Gary was saying earlier, it's just like really knuckling down on who you're targeting. Um, it just it it doesn't make sense for for myself as an Africa focused VC to get someone who is building something in the Nordics um, that isn't sustainable. It's got like that like you're building a, a I don't know a car for example. It doesn't make sense. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my time. Um, so I guess really really knuckling down and being. And, and getting an understanding of what the thesis is of that investor, the speed at which they invest, um, and then also just, I guess, your approach. Um, for me, um, all of all of my platforms are really open. I'm really open to founders. I just feel like transparency is really important. Um, just be honest. If things that you don't understand, say it. Like, to, to someone like me, it's like you telling me that you don't understand what a CAC is, but you're revenue focused. It's way more exciting than you pretending that you know what a, a, a term is. And I'm like, yeah, you don't speak the language, but I'm looking at pre seed sometimes. I'm not expecting you to have all, all the answers. Don't keep reiterating your product. Don't keep reiterating your deck. Just show me that you, you have the potential to grow. And I think that's really important. But again, just back to saving your time, just go after the people that are investing in your area and then have those clear cut conversations with them about whether or not they're investing right now. There's a lot of dry powder in the market, but there's also a lot of people who are just doing showboating and aren't investing. You do not want to be spending a lot of time nursing conversations with people who have no intention of investing in you. So yeah, I just get be, be quite succinct with those, those um, conversations. Yeah, and I guess the only thing I'll add is um, traction beats everything else, especially in this market. So, you know, if you have traction, you basically have a lot more leverage and if you have no traction. So focus on building traction with customers and if possible revenue as quickly as possible um, to kind of validate your model. And that will speak much more to investors than anything else that you would ever say. Um, if you don't have traction, then really have a compelling story. Right. Because I think you can only sell two things when you're a founder to an investor. Again, it depends on the stage. If you're early stage, you can sell vision without traction, maybe less so in this market. Um, but then if you have traction, that is a whole different ballgame. And then you can kind of control the shot. So I would always say to every founder, focus on traction first. If you don't have traction, then focus on the narrative. And I'll just add, just be prepared for the no's, but leverage them to help you get to your next stage. Because I think often we get discouraged, but at the end of the day, if you're a woman or fit in any, even if you're a white guy who's just under network, right? Um, sometimes just like find find ways to just overcome the no's by working through the no. Uh, by in, in doing that, it just involves like, you got to know because you don't have enough traction, work on the traction. You got to know because you, whatever's missing, just work on that. Um, I wish there was more time for us to kind of go over the many other questions that's come up in my head and that I wrote down, but thank you all three. This has been a wonderful experience. I don't know the last time I was on a panel with just all Black people in the, in, in the space. Um, I look forward to getting to know you more in, in the future. And definitely drinks on me, Gary, because I think you have a lot of stories to share. Uh, and if you Definitely. Just send me a message afterwards. No, we'll do it. We'll do it.